Welcome to this challenge. Today we're going to talk about airborne analysis. These challenges are for those of you who are unsure if the virtual crash products are right for you. And here we're showing you how you can conduct a full physics analysis, an accident reconstruction analysis, with the trial version of the virtual crash software products. This challenge is going to be focused on solving example problem 15.1 from Fundamentals of Traffic Crash Reconstruction, Volume 2, from Daly, Shigemura, and Daly. Let's go to the whiteboard. In this problem, we're told that a car goes off of an incline and strikes a pole and then lands on the opposite bank at the same height as the pole. Let's go ahead and just draw that out. So we'll just draw our ground plane here and here's our incline the angle of inclination is 20 degrees we have our car which I'll of course represent as a <coughs> box Here's its CG position right at the edge of the ramp. There's a pole that's struck And that pole is a distance of 15.65 feet from the position of the CG at the edge of the ramp. And our terrain looks something like this. up. Our car of course takes a parabolic arc. Some portion of this pole is hit, some evidence is left behind. This is not the greatest parabolic arc I've drawn. And it lands over here in in this part of the terrain and the pull impact was made by roughly the same portion of the car near the CG in height. So sometime when the CG of the car was at about this position at the pole, some portion of the car's exterior made contact with the pole, left some evidence behind. Let's draw our initial velocity vector, V, and I forgot to tell you what the total distance was. So we are fortunate enough to know what this distance is. 
and that distance is 112.11 feet. And of course the velocity vector has a 20 degree angle from the uh, horizontal direction. One other piece of information which is useful is that we know the vertical offset between the position of the CG at takeoff, let's say when it's right here, let's call that takeoff, and where that mark is on the pole. And that offset is said to be five feet. So this is a neat problem because what we'll find is <coughs> you're asked to solve for the um, takeoff speed and you could find that either just by using this mark right here and that's it or by using the landing position over here. And let me make a correction here. That's the position of the CG when the car, of course, is striking the hillside. So it's more appropriate to be something like this. Okay, here we go. Now we have the setup. So again, this is our terrain. A little dip here in the terrain. Let's say this is some kind of little hill. Car goes airborne, follows this parabolic path. And then when the front end of the car makes contact with the terrain right here, the CG is at this location. So that's the setup for the problem. Now to solve the problem, first we're going to define a position for our coordinate axes and uh, we could place our origin wherever we want and uh, I decided that we are going to start we're going to place our origin at the CG position at takeoff which is right here and we'll draw our x-axis x-hat following this line the horizontal line at takeoff And orthogonal to the x-axis, we have our z-axis. And now that we've defined our coordinate axes, we can solve the problem. So, so from basic kinematics, we know that the z-position that we expect for the car is going to be equal to its initial z coordinate plus this quantity, the z component of its velocity times time minus one half times g minus one half times g times t squared, where g is the gravitational acceleration constant. The x position as a function of time is going to equal to the initial x position plus the x component of the velocity times time. There's no acceleration in the x direction. And we know what the well, first of all, we know we defined the initial x position to be 0, and we defined the initial z position to be 0. And we know the total distance traveled at the final time, which we'll call tf. So at tf, the center of gravity is here when the car is smashing into the hill. And we know what that distance is. 
at simply 112.11 feet. And that's just equal to the initial, the x component of the, of the initial velocity times time. So we can solve for what the final time is. And I'm just going to call this position right here the x-coordinate of the center of gravity. When the car hits the hill, I'm going to call that xf for convenience. Now let's go to our equation for the z position. That simplifies to this expression. At TF, when it's smashing into the hill, we have this. And we're just going to substitute TF over here and over here. And again, when the car is smashing into <coughs> the hill, it's at the x-coordinate xf, and we'll call the z-coordinate zf. And we know the x-coordinate is equal to 112.11, and the z-coordinate is equal to 5. Don't forget it was displaced in z at the z same <laughs> at the same height that it hit that pole but that takeoff was at the initial z coordinate which we defined as 0 because we placed our coordinate axis origin at the cg location at takeoff and then it went at five feet above that position it hit the pole and then went through the arc apexed and then went down again and when the cg was five feet again five feet above the takeoff position of the cg that's when the front end made contact with the hillside so at time tf the final time the CG position is at ZF. Now let's go to our second whiteboard. We're getting fancy using two whiteboards to solve this problem. So we have ZF is equal to VZI times this quantity minus one half G XF EXI squared and now it's time to write out what VXI and VZI are. First, we can put these VXI terms upstairs, so multiply both sides by of the equation by VXI squared, and you'll get this. Now this is something that's starting to look exciting to a physicist.
Okay, let's write out what these um, terms are, VXI and VZI. So don't forget, <coughs> here's our CG at takeoff, here's our velocity vector, V, it's at an angle of 20 degrees with respect to the horizontal direction, which is aligned along X hat. And so the X component of the velocity vector at takeoff is simply equal to whatever the magnitude of V is times cosine of theta and VZI is equal to whatever the magnitude of the velocity is times the sine of theta. So we're being asked to solve for V and so we have to write out what these expressions are and put them in to our equation here. So let's go ahead and do that. Now we have, let's just rewrite this now after um, writing out what our components are. So VXI squared is V squared cosine squared theta. And then here's our VZ term. And then you have a VX term, VXI term here. So these two guys become V squared cosine theta times sine theta times xf. This is starting to look pretty. Now <clears throat> we want to solve for v, so you just do a little algebra magic. Let's bring this term over here and factor. This is where it's getting fun. Now we can solve for V by dividing both sides by this long term and then taking the square root of both sides. And that leaves you with something that looks like this. And I just found a bug. This square here should have been applied to xf, so you need an xf square here, xf square here, xf square here. Okay, here we go. Nobody's perfect. And that should be an equal and a minus sign. There we go. Okay, and um, we're going to multiply upstairs and downstairs by minus 1 to make a better looking expression. I, I hate negative numerators, just a personal preference. And this is all taken to the 1 half power because we took the square root of both sides. And we can make this even more pretty by factoring out a cosine square term. And of course, we can bring this guy outside of our square root because he's squared. And so our expression in its final form will look something like this. G over 2. f tangent theta minus zf. Beautiful. There it is. Error free, I promise. So you may have seen this presented in uh, a number of different ways, uh, depending on how the coordinate axes and sign conventions are set up. You may see this written as uh, ZF or H minus your uh, final distance tangent theta 
Um, this is written out according to our convention that we use to develop the problem. And so uh, ZF in our problem here is plus five because we're five feet above the CG position, uh, which the initial CG position was at zero feet. So we're five feet above that. And so uh, this term here would be in fact negative five or minus five feet, excuse me. Okay, so we have our final expression. We have all of our values. And now we can go to my favorite website, Wolfram Alpha, and we can solve the problem. I want to get, I want to write all my values, initial values here. So theta was 20 degrees. The final position was 112.11 feet. And the final height was 5 feet. So those are our initial parameters. And we could figure out the uh, magnitude of the velocity at takeoff just with those and our equation right here. And again, you could have solved this problem simply using uh, the evidence uh, left on the pole here without regard to the final impact point. And that's a neat cross check. And that's also a neat technique in the field if you don't, if you don't, uh, if you aren't lucky enough to know the CG height when uh, the vehicle struck over here, or you just don't have this evidence and you only have um, this information right here, you can, you can apply the same analysis and get the uh, pre-impact uh, velocity, magnitude of the pre-impact velocity by using the same analysis approach, and that's shown by Daly and the same example problem. Okay, so let's go to good old Wolfram Alpha, and let's just uh, type away. Now, uh, we want our final units in miles per hour, so let's put a conversion factor from feet per second to miles per hour. And here's XF. And Wolfram Alpha is cool. You can uh, you can simply type in the angle in degrees. Just make sure your answers make sense. Seventy four over two half of gravity. I didn't miss any parentheses. Okay, there it is, 54.52 miles per hour. It's a little different from the daily answer, which was 54.49 miles per hour. And that has to do with the fact that um, I keep, I tend to keep uh, all of my constants in the expressions like G and uh, you'll find in some formula sheets and some developments that when a uh, final equation is written for uh, like an airborne analysis equation, you'll see the answer being some numerical constant like 2.73 times a bunch of other stuff. And that's because these, these terms like g over 2, the square root of g over 2 are factored out for you for convenience. And uh, there could be some minor uh, rounding issues when you do that. So I, I like, that's why I like to keep my constants in plain view, my universal constants like G, and uh, keep it there till the end. It's just a, uh, a preference of mine. Uh, being a physicist, that's, that's sort of how I was brought up. In any event, here's our final answer, 54.52. Um, so now we're going to solve the same problem with virtual crash. And we're going to develop the same scenario. It's, it's going to be a neat exercise we're going to go through. And I'll show you how uh, you can get the x and, y, x and uh, z position of the vehicle. Excuse me. You can get the x and y position of the vehicle. You can't get z out um, in the trial version. And you can show your, you can prove to yourself that uh, 
virtual crash is doing exactly what you would expect from an accident reconstruction or physics standpoint. And you can even go off and do your own experiments and tests and prove to yourself that virtual crash is doing everything you would expect it to do as a physics simulation tool. So let's go to our scene. Here is a, uh, again, I'm using simply using the trial version so you can do the exact same thing. We're going to left click over here on the uh, left control panel and pull out a car. It doesn't matter what car you pull out, they're all the same because it's a trial version. And you can edit the properties of the car either by uh, selecting the car and right clicking or you can go over here to the left side and hit edit. And then uh, this window here will have all of your objects. And if you select a AC Cobra, you get access to all of its properties, including its position and orientation. So let's put it at zero, zero. And if we increase X, we see it goes from left to right. And if we increase Y, we see it goes upward. So if you just wanted to get an idea of the uh, coordinate axes conventions in Virtual Crash, this is a good way to do it. Z is up. So we're using different convi conventions from other utilities. And you can see I put it, I put it below the XY plane. And uh, as soon as you move it around, it pops back up. And that's because there is a feature to auto align the vehicle to the, uh, the plane that's available, the contact plane that's beneath it. And uh, you can define your own surfaces and it'll auto align the tires to be in contact with that plane if you have some more complicated surface. Okay, so here we are, zero, zero. And what I want to do is uh, draw a few shapes for reference. So let's draw, I like to use flat boxes. So boxes are neat to have these grips right here to let you control their dimensions. And for what it's calling length, I want to make it zero. So now we just have a plane. And I want to place it at zero, zero. And I want to change its color. I want to draw another one. I'm going to clone this guy, make a simple clone. And I'm going to place this guy at the pole position, which was 15.65 feet away from the CG position at takeoff. And let's align him with y equals 0. So that's the pole position. And let's put the final position when the guy uh, crashes into the uh, hillside. Okay, so this is where the, gar the car, uh, car CG position should be. It should cross that plane when the vehicle smashing into the hill. All right. Now let's put a couple of uh, vertical references. Change your color. Whoa. And I'm going to put the first reference at 10 feet, and I'll show you why soon. And I'll put the second reference at 15 feet. And 15 feet, so five feet above the pole and uh, five feet above the takeoff position, 
of the CG is when the pole contact is made. So we want that reference. Also, five feet above is where the CG was when it hits the hillside, the car hit, hits the hillside. So what I want to do is I want to define my takeoff um, such that the CG of the car is 10 feet above ground level, let's call this ground level, and then five feet above that, the car is hitting the pole. So I think I've got all of my references that I need. So let's go into profile mode, view. I want to change the background color to white. I want to change my car to something else other than gray. And <clears throat> let's first solve the problem in a uh, not very exciting way. Uh, let's, let's not reconstruct the scene itself. Let's just solve the problem by cheating a little bit. We're going to um, place the car CG 10 feet above the ground. And we're going to uh, rotate about its pitch axis to be pointing uh, at an angle of 20 degrees with respect to horizontal. And now all we have to do is iterate on the uh, takeoff speed, like so, until we see its trajectory cross two points. So we're, pre we're pretty much already done. <laughs> we're pretty much done with the problem already. So here we see a red line indicating the vehicle's trajectory about its uh, center of gravity. And we defined this intersection right here as five feet, this orange plane right here, again, is five feet above the CG's position at takeoff. This yellow line right here would be the position of the pole being 15.65 feet away from the CG's takeoff position along the x-axis. So it intersects, the trajectory must intersect with this point. And then if we go to the CG position where it smash, the car smashes into the hillside, the CG must be right here. And we can see that our trajectory is almost going through there. We just have to tweak it just a little bit. But we already see we have a reasonable uh, solution without doing any more work. We basically intersected uh, both points of the problem along the trajectory at about 54 and a half miles per hour. And the solution was 54 and a half miles per hour. So we can declare victory and stop using this iterative approach. Uh, we solved the problem if we hadn't, even if we hadn't have, uh, even if we didn't do our paper and pencil calculation using standard accident reconstruction methods. And we first came to our simulator, uh, we could have declared victory and said we solved the problem and we could see that we got what we would expect to have gotten. Well let's plug in 54 since we know the answer uh, analytically let's just plug in that solution and take a closer look at what's going on with the trajectory. So again we see it going through the first part, part the first intersection point defined and our problem at that pole. And let's look over here. And we see a slight offset from where the CG coordinate goes through upon the hill impact and where our trajectory is in virtual crash. And that offset is 
just reading the data below. Looks like it's maybe on the order of less than half of a foot. So let's explore why. Well, here's another thing we could have done. If you didn't want to do this with a car, let's make a sphere. Physicists love spheres. And we love approximating everything using them. And let's make this into a physics uh, rigid body object so that it can participate in the physics simulation. Let's put it at y equals negative 10, x equals 0, and start it at the same height as our car, CG. And let's make the radius pretty small. And we're going to give it the same initial conditions as our car. And it should follow, um, well, I put the wrong speed in. This will be 54.5249. There we go. It should follow the same trajectory as our car's center of gravity. And we see them moving together. Let's go back to the profile view. So here's our sphere's trajectory. And I'm going to use control, left click to also select the uh, car. So I'm selecting the sphere and the car, and our trajectories of both are being shown simultaneously. And we can see them overlapping beautifully on top of each other. But still, at that intersection point, we see something interesting going on. There's still an offset between even the sphere and where we expect the CG to intersect at the hillside impact location to find the problem at 112 feet. So we've defined all of the uh, initial conditions correctly according to the problem. We know what the analytic solution is to the problem, but we see a slight discrepancy in the final answer at 112 feet away. And when you see something like this in a, in a uh, physics simulation package that uses numerical integration, one of the first things you should suspect is the time step that's being used by the numerical integration. And so if we go to the simulation button on the left side control panel, we can look at a little more detail at the data that's being used by the numerical integrator. And here we see a parameter integration time step. The larger that value is, the faster the simulation will run, but that faster simulation speed or time at which the simulation finishes will come at the expense of the accuracy of your results. So it's always better if you can to minimize the integration time step size for the most accurate results you can get. And obviously the more objects you're simulating and the more complex your simulation, the longer it'll take for you to get your result. Here it's not an issue because we're only simulating uh, two objects. So we turn that integration time step down as low as it'll go. And let's look again at the, um, at the trajectories, the airborne trajectories. And we could see now um, there's still a slight offset, but now we're uh, at a just a fraction of an inch, I would say. Um, actually, we can get an idea by adjusting our sphere size. <laughs> so point oh oh five feet is the order of inaccuracy in our result. 
which is 0 0.06 inches of an offset. I hope that is acceptable to most of you to accept that level of inaccuracy from a numerical integration software tool. So I'll declare victory on that problem too. So we see that our objects, both the sphere and the car, intersect the two expected points along the parabolic, parabolic arc. And in principle, we're done. But uh, let's address another issue that you might notice that you feel uneasy about. You'll notice that our car is maintaining a constant pitch angle over time, but that's not how it's represented in the problem. And that's not what you would expect in reality. And of course, the reason why is because we positioned the car initially floating in the air with a uh, initial velocity uh, vector. And there is no mechanism to impart torque to this vehicle. So there's nothing to cause rotation. And so you wouldn't expect it, the pitch angle to change over time. Well, let, let's, uh, let's set up now um, a plane for this car to take off along. And actually, I think what I want to do is I want to clone our car. Let's go ahead and make a clone. And instead of instead of using there's our clone. All right. Instead of using uh, our first car, we're going to use our, our clone car and send that up an incline plane and see what difference that makes to the uh, overall dynamics while it's in airborne, while it's airborne. So let's make a, a plane and these plane objects are used um, for terrain surfaces which can interact with the vehicle wheels and you can uh, deform them. We're going to do that and make your own custom terrains. We're going to make the pitch 20 degrees. And let's move this plane to be in contact with the vehicle wheels. And we have to remember remember that our suspended vehicle had unloaded suspension, but if the car is driving along a plane, it's going to have uh, loaded suspension. So it's a little trickier of a situation. And we want the car to stay positioned such that when its CG is at x equals zero, Um, the CG is going to be forward, begin to be forward of the edge of the plane. Okay. Let's look at our top-down view as well. So here's our plane. And now what we want to do is make the plane into a uh, unyielding terrain. <laughs> so now the car will interact with it. And we want to move our car back, at least to the point where both wheels are in contact with it, so that we can build up those uh, torque effects.
what we're trying to do now is align the plane on the fly so that we have the right CG position at takeoff. There's going to be a little inaccuracy here because I only have so much patience to iterate. There we go. I think that's good enough. And then the other thing we have to remember is if the car starts down the plane with our initial speed of 54.52 miles per hour, that by the time it gets to um, the initial takeoff position for our problem, it's going to have a lower speed. See, there's 53, about 53.594 miles per hour because it's been, it's decelerating a little bit as it's making its way up the ramp. So we're going to have to compensate by increasing its speed uh, a little bit. Fifty-four and a half at this point. So I think that's a good approximation. So the car starting a little bit lower down the ramp. It's making its way up. By the time it gets to the launch position, it's at 54 and a half miles per hour to match our problem. And what we've done now is we're allowing, um, we're allowing there to be torque acting on the vehicle because of the normal force, um, on, mainly due to the normal force on the rear wheel during a time in which the front wheel has already lost contact with the inclined plane. And if we zoom out, I bet you we're going to see the car rotating because of that torque, imparting an initial angular velocity uh, about the car's y-axis. And there it goes, rotating, just like you would expect, and as it's drawn out in the uh, daily problem, the daily example problem. There it goes. Now, how does this compare to the car that we're simply launching in the air without contact with anything well there's that don't rem and, and remember we started the uh the problem originally with the cg at zero zero and uh, we can't do that with um, our car that's actually going up the plane because we want to see those rotational effects but you get the idea let's let's scroll through using our left click along this time slider and you can see a difference in the um, overall motion of the vehicle one rotates and the other one doesn't and you can see their CGs both following uh, the same parabolic arc and we can see our sphere also just beautiful so I'm going to declare victory on this aspect of the problem as well. We're now simulating a car jumping off of a plane, not, not just using an ideal case. And so now we're going to, for the rest of our um, solution here, we're going to uh, disregard the idealized car. Let's turn off that sphere as well. And everything else we're going to do is with respect to the simulated car going up the plane with wheels in contact with the plane, allowing for rotational motion. So let's try to recreate the scene using the Virtual Crash 3 system. First, let's set up a pole using a cylinder object, which you can find over here in the 3D geometry shapes. Just left click, pick if you how you want to set up your cylinder. It doesn't really matter too much at this point. We just want the shape in there. Let's change its color to be pole like. Let's make it a one foot pole. And let's align it <coughs> with <coughs> where it should be according to the problem. We're going to use that reference plane that we had set up initially. And 
and I want to make it a 40 foot tall pole for a reason. Which means we should set its geometrical, the height at which the geometrical center sits at 20. So there's our pole. Now I want to make some terrain. And the way we're going to do that is to make a plane object. We're going to make two planes. One for the takeoff portion of the problem and one for the landing portion of the problem. view the uh, wireframe view and we can make a lot of segments in this plane if we want to and the more segments we have the more uh, nodes there will be to deform what we want to do is convert this plane into a mesh and by doing so we can uh, manipulate the position of the vertices or the polygons in three-dimensional space and what we want to do for this problem is deform those nodes so that it has the same side profile as our ramp because we're trying to make a visual of a car going basically off a hillside. So let's go ahead and do that. And the way we're going to do that is by selecting proportional editing and picking out some of these vertices. Use your scroll wheel to select more of them. Oh, we also want to constrain our motion to be along the z-axis. And the other thing we want is we want one of our views to be of the side profile so that we can kind of see when we're getting close to our inclined plane. All right. So let's pick this guy and simply move your mouse up and the motion will be constrained along the z-axis. And you can see that it's the uh, vertices within the circle that are moving. Um, but as you get further away from the particular node or vertex that was selected, the effect of the upward motion on the mouse is decreased. And that's because I selected proportional editing. That's a really a really handy feature. Let's grab this guy now. You see we're just trying to match that side profile of the inclined plane. We're trying to give the appearance of a hill. And we're not actually going to have the car running up this hill for the simulation. We're going to um, we're not going to allow the car to use our mesh here as the terrain model because we want to follow the precise 20 degree takeoff angle. But what we can do is we can hide the plane within this terrain to give the appearance of the hill. Now, if you, can, if you have the patience to precisely modify your terrain to match the 20 degree angle needed for takeoff, then go ahead and do it. I'm just choosing not to do it for this problem. Let's get some of the ones on this side. And you can go crazy sculpting your 
seen as much as you wish. change the color of the plane to help us out a little bit more. There we go. Let's take a look. So there we have a terrain uh, that's leading roughly at a 20 degree angle along the x direction with respect to the x direction and let's bring our car back and let's hide our plane Oop, wrong plane okay so when our car is running up the plane it's not using the underlying terrain for takeoff it's using uh, the hidden plane it's not using the uh, molded terrain model that we just modified but it's giving the illusion that it's caused that the um, takeoff angle is being caused by the the underlying surface which is what we want now maybe we want to um, put a grass and dirt texture on our plane So we do that by drawing first drawing a square and go to the gallery and go to textures and let's select grass too. You just drag it with the left mouse and drop it. Release the mouse when you're inside of your square object and say yes. And the way that the, um, the surface plane objects receive the texture information is by uh, receiving a projection. So we just press receive projection and we can see that the contact plane takes whatever the texture map is on, of the object underneath it and assigns it to itself. And we can see that the texture is mapped to the, uh, to the molded surface that we just uh, modified. So there it is. Now all we need is something on the other side to hit. So let's do the same thing again with a different plane. And this one we actually want to make an immovable surface because we want that car to hit it. But we're going to go through the same procedure here. Oops. frame and 
we're going to make it a mesh. Go to the uh, vertex view. And now what we want to do is make a hillside that's aligned with the about 112 feet away. Now remember the car CG is 112 feet away when it hits the hillside. So we gotta be a little careful about how we do this, but let's just grab a bunch of these guys and elevate them using our lasso tool. Actually, let's do this in a reasonable way. Let's elevate a few at a time. Z rotation, restrict to Z. So let's elevate these guys a lot. right click to get the uh, control grip. So we're just elevating uniformly all these uh, vertices. And maybe we want to make the uh, transition a little smoother here. Now we can get in with our, using our other method. To control region by region, the uh, specific vertices to make it a, a little better, a little smoother appearance, a little more organic. Just depends on what you want to do, how much patience you have. So here we have our simulation showing the pole impact and impact on the hillside.